Today we're going to show you how to build a form for your concrete slab. Step 1. Preparing the ground. Before you start building the form, it is important to prepare the ground by removing any debris or rocks. Next, level the ground by adding or removing soil as needed. Step 2. Determining the size and shape. Determine the size and shape of the slab that you want to pour. Use stakes and strings to outline the perimeter of the form. Step 3. Building the form. Line up the boards for each side of the form and splice them together with 4 foot splices. Look for the crown in each board and place the crown facing up. Also, locate the bow in each board and have the bow on the outside of the form. It's easy to push the crown down and push the bow in later with stakes. Stand up and screw the form boards together, starting at the first corner stake. Measure the lengths of each side and mark at the correct distance. You can cut off excess length to keep the work area clear. Step 4. Square and level the form. If you are building a large form like this one, I recommend using batter boards. Build batter boards with stakes and scrap 2x4s. Place them 2 foot on the outside of each corner. If you have a laser level, use it to make the tops of your batter boards the same height as the form. If you don't have a laser level, you can use a 3 foot level. All right, so here's a pretty simple knot that you can do with your string. Figure out about where you want it at. You always want to go about a foot back. That way, when you put it on, it has a lot of tension. So you'll just grab it, make a loop. Twist it up a little bit. And then you're just going to wrap it around. Can you see that? Here, let me get in a little closer on it. All right. Go ahead. So you just made a loop. Stick it through the hole. And pull it tight. And there you have it. Now we can attach that. Now, attach string lines to your batter boards. Make sure your lines are tight so they don't sag. Use these lines to straighten and level your form boards. Now measure the diagonal length between the opposite corners. These two measurements should be the same if the form is square. Adjust the location of your corners as needed to get the measurements the same. Now use stakes placed every four feet to straighten and level the form.
use the 345 method to make sure the corners of your form are square. So now I'm going to explain the 345 method. So if we measure three foot here, four foot here, we should have a perfect five foot on the hypotenuse of this right triangle. So let's try it out. You can either measure consistently from the outside of the form or the inside. I'll measure from the outside of the form as it's a little easier to hook the tape measure to it. So here's our three foot, here's our four foot. And now since I pulled my measurements from the outside of the form, I've transcribed my line all the way across. I will measure from this outside corner where this line is to this outside side corner where this line is. Don't worry about this board because that's a scab on the outside of the form. So when I come across here, I should have a perfect five foot, 60 inches, make sure that's nice and straight. So we can see that we're right at our five foot mark, which means that this is a perfect right angle in this corner of the form. We'll go ahead and check the other three corners now. Attach kickers in between the stake locations as necessary to reinforce the form. Step five, digging footers. If you have engineered drawings, refer to those for footer locations, width, and depth. At a minimum, dig a one foot by one foot footer inside the perimeter of the form. The thicker concrete in the footers is capable of supporting more weight. Footers are placed below load-bearing walls to distribute the weight of the structure. The perimeter walls are always load-bearing. That is why we go ahead and put footers inside the perimeter of the form. If you have load-bearing walls inside of the building, you should also dig footers where those walls will be placed. We are adding plumbing to this structure, so the visqueen and rebar will be added later. We are installing the plumbing that will be going in the slab. Use your floor plans to figure out your stub up locations. Measure and mark these locations with blue paint. Now we will dig a trench for the main trunk line. I advise you consult with a plumber to help draw your plumbing layout, as this is literally going in concrete and will be difficult to adjust later. Decide what size pipe you will be using. I am using four inch for the toilets, three inch for the trunk line, and two inch for everything else. You can reduce the two inch for sinks and other small sources later in the building process. The trunk line is 3 inch Schedule 40 pipe. Next, we will install the sanitary tees that will go to each plumbing fixture. Locate your plumbing stub ups. Use your floor plans to figure out how far from the edge of the forms your stub ups will be. The fixture locations are staked with half inch metal pipe. Make sure all pipes have the correct slope. 1 8 inch to 1 quarter inch of drop per foot or 1 8 to a quarter bubble on a level. Cut pipe and glue elbows at each stake. The center of the toilet stub up is usually 12 inches from the finished wall behind it. Some toilets have a rough end distance of 10 or 14 inches, so if you have a particular toilet that you want to purchase, check with the manufacturer for rough end specifications. Make sure the elbows are square and level. You can pack the pipe with dirt to keep it from moving. Once you have your stub ups in the correct locations and level, use stakes and duct tape to make sure they won't move during the concrete pour. Make sure to use plenty of primer and glue. Inspectors will look for purple primer at every joint.
install risers on each elbow. Vent stacks, sink drains, and washing machine drains typically go inside of wall cavities. Make sure to install P-traps at tub and shower locations. This job requires an inspection, so we install caps on all the risers and extend one riser to 8 feet and fill it with water to check for leaks. Our plumbing inspection was passed. We went ahead and packed the pipes in with dirt and now we are going to prepare for our foundation inspection and concrete. We will start by laying out the moisture barrier. Our local code requires a minimum of six millimeter thick plastic sheeting underneath the concrete. Get a second person to help spread the plastic. Fill the footers and leave a little slack. When the concrete is poured, the sheeting will get pushed into the corners and take up the slack. Use a stapler to attach the sheeting to the form. Cut off any excess on the outside of the form. Mark and cut holes for any penetrations you may have. If you are using multiple sheets, make sure they overlap at least one foot. Then use bricks to hold the plastic down.
All right, so we're getting ready to set our rebar in our trenches for the footers. And what I have here is called a rod chair. They're about a dollar a piece at Home Depot. And it has two indents for your two pieces of rebar that are gonna sit in the bottom of the trench. It keeps them well spaced and it keeps the proper height off the ground. So we're gonna use these to position our rebar. And then we also have bricks to help support it in between because I didn't buy a whole bunch of these just for the corners. You can bend half inch and thinner rebar pretty easily without special tools. Any bends in rebar need to be rounded. Do not make a hard 90 degree angle. Most code calls for five rod diameters for the length of the bend. With half inch rebar, the bend should take place over no less than two and a half inches. Now we will set the rebar in the chairs and on bricks. The rebar should be at least two inches from the bottom and sides of the form. Rebar thickness is measured in one eighth inch increments. For example, number one rebar is one eighth of an inch. Number two is two eighths of an inch. Number three is three eighths of an inch and number four is four eighths of an inch and so on. Continuous rebar joints need to be overlapped by 40 bar diameters. We are using number four rebar, which is one half inch thick. Multiply the thickness, a half inch, by 40, which gives us 20 inches. We need at least a 20 inch overlap. Tie the rebar with tie wire. Place a tie at each end and one in the middle. Make sure the ties are tight and the rebar is secure. Now we're ready for our foundation inspection. In our next video, we will be pouring concrete. Thanks for watching and consider subscribing. We'll see you in the next video. We passed our foundation inspection and now we're ready to pour concrete. I'm spraying the forms with vegetable oil. This keeps the concrete from sticking to the wood and makes removing the forms easier. The first truck just arrived. Each load of concrete is inspected by the lead man to make sure it is the correct consistency. More water can be added to the slurry to make it easier to spread. However, you don't want too much water because it will reduce the strength of the finished concrete. They are starting with the recessed shower. This will give the shower time to start drying so the wooden frame can be removed later. Due to the size of the pour and the time sensitive nature of the material, I decided to let the professionals handle this one. I've done smaller jobs, but would recommend hiring finishers for anything this big. You can see they have already hand troweled around the form. The conduits and pipes that are not buried need to be anchored down so that they do not float to the top of the concrete. The workers use concrete spreaders to pull the concrete to the far side of the form and fill the footers. As each section gets filled, the driver moves the truck forward so they can start filling the next section. Then, two finishers begin screeding the filled area with an aluminum screed board. If you don't have a screed board, a 2x4 will suffice. Workers place stakes in the middle of the form with the nail in the side to show the elevation of the finished concrete. The finishers use the stake with the nail to spread the concrete at the proper height. The second truck just arrived.
as they screed the concrete, other workers add and remove concrete with spreaders. This allows them to fill low areas that become apparent after screeding. As the third truck arrives, one finisher begins floating the concrete on the other end. He uses a bull float to push the aggregate down and smooth out imperfections. He will continue this process long after all of the concrete is poured. This is aesthetically my favorite part. While he continues floating, other workers hand trowel the perimeter of the form and around the pipes sticking out of the concrete. As the concrete approaches, the bricks holding down the plastic sheeting are removed from the work area so that they don't get buried under concrete. The work is a continuous symphony from the time the first truck arrives until hours after the last truck leaves. After the third truck was empty, we calculated the amount of concrete necessary to finish the job and added an extra yard just to be safe. If another truck has to come back for less than three yards, you will get charged a trip fee, so I figure it's better to pay for an extra yard and not need it. The fourth and final truck just arrived. The excess concrete will be dumped in a low area that needs to be filled anyway. Concrete has set for an hour and now the crew is ready to use the power trowel. He keeps the surface of the concrete wet so the power trowel doesn't gouge the surface.
So we've let the concrete cure for a few days and now we're going to remove the forms. We're going to start by shoveling out along the perimeter of the form so that we can access the screws that are holding the stakes together. We'll remove those screws and then we'll be able to disassemble the form. So check out this detail right here. We used a one by one trim board to make this one inch by one inch recess. And this is called a metal ledge. Similar concept as a brick ledge. The metal building framing is going here and then the metal siding is going to sit down into this metal ledge. That way, if water hits this, water might get under the metal siding, but it cannot get under the framing and into the house. So that's all there is for the concrete. We'll have a metal building delivered in a couple of weeks. So check out our next video to see that getting put up. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Consider subscribing and we'll see you on the next one. Today we're going to be erecting our metal building. We start by measuring the slab and making sure that it is the correct dimensions. Then we pop some string lines so that we know where the base rail should end up. Next we'll drill holes in the base plate for our anchor bolts. Once we set the base plate in place, we will go ahead and hammer drill into the concrete and set our concrete anchors. As you anchor the base rail down, you can tap it with a hammer to make sure that it is in the correct location. So they're anchoring down the base rails with these little concrete anchors. This is a wedge style anchor. So they drill the hole, they hammer this down in there. So as this nut goes down, it pulls this bolt up and this little sleeve right here has ridges on it. So this sleeve stays put in the concrete and then this nodule right here pushes up into it and expands and that compression is what holds this together. Next, we get our trusses laid out and ready to be stood up. Go ahead and attach the legs with the provided screws and then attach the braces from the legs to the truss. Next, we're going to put the sheet metal on the end caps of the trusses. You can roughly cut and screw the metal to the end caps. Use a string line to make sure that all your screws are in the center of the square tubing.
Next, flip the truss over and cut off the excess metal. You'll see that there are screws placed in the top of the truss. These screws mark the location for the hat channel. Once all the trusses are up, you will simply be able to set the hat channel on top and slide it down to the screw and then screw it into the correct location. Then you can remove those excess screws. Now let's go ahead and stand up all of our trusses. We'll start with one of the end trusses with the sheet metal facing outwards. Once that first truss is up, go ahead and put a brace on it to keep it square and level. Next, continue putting all of the trusses up. Now we're setting in place the last end truss with the sheet metal facing outwards. Now we're installing the base plate on each end of the metal building. Make sure the inside of the base plate lines up with the blue chalk line. Measuring from the top down on each corner leg, mark a similar height. Ours is 64 inches. Then you can use a laser level to set all four corners at the same height. Attach a string line and adjust the height of each leg so that the same measurement from the top down is at the same height on the string line. This will assure that your building is level. If you do not have a laser level, you can use a three foot level on the hat channel in between each truss and work your way down the building. You'll see here that we use a block and an extra post to lift up some of these posts and make sure that they are at the correct height. At this point, we're going to start preparing the hat channel for the roof. We set it against the bottom of the trusses and mark out each truss location. That way, when we set it on the roof, all we have to do is line up the marks with the trusses and screw them in. This saves us a lot of time and measurement while we're on top of the roof. Now we will begin installing the first hat channel on each side. Set the hat channel on top, slide it down to the edge, and use the marks that we placed earlier to line it up with the trusses. Screwing in this first hat channel will actually help square all of the trusses of the building. Our building has a six inch overhang on both ends. Sometimes you'll need to adjust the truss a little bit to get it to fall within the lines. But this is good as it helps square up the truss and make sure that they have the proper spacing. Now we will simply set the hat channel on the screws that we placed earlier. Once they are set in place, go ahead and screw them in. Now we will place all of the vertical posts on both of the end walls. In our building, we set a post every five feet. We attach the post at the top and bottom with 90 degree angle brackets and screws. At 
this point, we will use ratchet straps to rack the building and make sure that our framing is square and plumb. Once the building is square and plumb, we go ahead and start attaching the siding. The siding will lock the building in and keep it from shifting once the straps are removed. We are not putting all of the screws in just yet. You can see that we are putting screws on the corners and down the center. We will come back later and place the rest of the screws. The last piece of siding goes on the bottom. We cut each piece to fit nicely into the brick ledge at the bottom. It's a good idea to periodically check and make sure that your building is still square as you're putting your sheeting on and especially before you attach roofing panels. Next we'll set the door in place, make sure it is nice and level and make sure that it is even with the structural framing on the outside. Next we'll put our header in and attach it with angle brackets and screws. Then we'll put the side post on and attach it with angle brackets and screws as well. At this point, I must recommend that you leave at least a quarter to a half inch on the side of your door to that side post. That way you'll have space to shim your door later and make sure that it opens and closes properly. For now, we just attached one screw on each side of the door to hold it in place. Next we attach the J-channel trim and then we can continue putting the siding on the building. I'm going to be purchasing and installing residential style windows into this metal building later. So stay tuned for another video and I'll explain how to do that. As the last of the siding is going into place, we get prepared to install roofing panels. As we set roofing panels in place, we place screws at the very top hat channel and also the second from the bottom hat channel. We don't place screws in the very bottom hat channel because we still have to come back and place eave trim. Once all of the panels are in place, we start putting trim on and then attaching the remainder of the screws. So unfortunately, we lost all the footage of the guys installing the trim. So I'm just gonna talk about it instead. So the first piece of trim that they install is the corner trim all the way around the building. Obviously, there's one piece that goes on each corner. You simply set the corner trim in place and you pop a screw in every other ridge on the siding panel. This corner trim tidies up where the two side panels come in and hides that seam. The trim that they use is long on one side and short on the other. So they only screw to the long side. If you have trim that is wide on both sides, you're going to wanna put a 
screw on both sides in the ridges. So the next piece of trim that they installed was the eave trim. That's the trim that goes down both long sides of the building here in the front and in the back. When we installed the roofing panels, the reason that I said to leave the first row of screws out was so that you could push this roofing panel up and slide this trim between it and the structural framing. So once you slide that in, you simply pop a screw in every location straight up where you have structural framing. So then you overlap the trim a little bit, six inches to a foot, and you just go all the way down the side. So once you have it all screwed in from underneath, you come back, make sure this is pushed all the way in, and you put the remainder of your roofing screws in, which secures this in place. So the next trim that's installed is the gable trim. The gable trim is on the gable ends of the building, which is the ends that come up and form a point. So on this side and the other side of the building is the gable trim. So the gable trim installs much the same way as the eave trim, except on this, you need to make sure that you make your cuts in your corners and in the center, you need to make your plumb cut, that way you have a nice transition. So the very last trim that is installed is the ridge cap, which goes down the center of the roof along the ridge, and it hides the two joints where the ends of the roofing panels meet up. It covers that up, you screw it in at every other ridge, just like the corner trim, and then it overlaps on the outside of the gable trim. On this building, they just simply folded it down and screwed it in, or you could have it come out about an inch, just to keep the water away from your vertical cut at the center of your gable trim. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned for future videos. We're going to be installing residential windows in this building, and then we're going to frame out the inside to get all of our rooms and our bathrooms situated. So stay with us on our journey, continue to learn with us, and I'll see you on the next one. So we're going to be installing installing some residential windows with brick mold into this metal building. You can take the brick mold off by cutting it with a razor knife. However, I'm going to leave it on there because I like the aesthetic of it. We're going to be framing out in between these metal posts with some two by fours and then placing the window in. So let's get a measurement on our window and figure out where we're going to install it. So this is a three foot by five foot window. So it should be 36 inches by 60 inches. Now the brick mold adds another half inch to each side, top and bottom. So it should be 37 by 61 inches. Let's go ahead and verify that. So we see here that we have 37 inches on the width and 61 inches on the height. So when I measure out and cut the hole in the wall, I'm going to add an extra quarter inch to the width and a quarter inch to the height. That way I have room to install my trim all the way around and then the window will not be too snug to fit in there properly. So normally when you install a window, the bottom of the window is either two or three foot off the ground. However, with these taller windows like this, you don't want the top of your window to be above the top of your door because then you won't have that nice line on the outside of your building. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure my door and I'm going to place the top of all my window openings at the same height as the top of the door. So my door is 82 inches tall. So the top of my windows is going to be at 82 inches and then whatever the remainder of the height is will be the distance from the floor. I'm going to center the window in this cavity here between these two vertical posts. We have 57 and a half inches. My window is 37 inches wide, but my opening is going to be 37 and a quarter inches wide to allow some room for the trim and to make sure it's not too tight when I go to put it in. If I subtract 37 and a quarter from my 57 and a half, that will give me 20 and one quarter inches. I should be 10 and one eighth inches off of each side. So I'm going to mark my 10 and one eighth here. And I'll mark my 10 and 1 8 over here. And I'll verify this measurement. Should be 37 and a quarter. And it is. The bottom of my window is going to be 21 inches off of the ground. So I'll come down here and I'll mark my 21 and find my bottom corners. So now that I have my 21 inches marked from the floor to the wall, I'm going to use a level to make sure I have a nice level straight line across here. Now I'm going to draw my vertical lines using the marks that I made earlier. So now I'm going to measure 83 inches to the top and draw my top line of the opening. I'm also going to verify that my case opening is the same width at the top, middle, and bottom before I start cutting this out. 
Since the metals run horizontally and you have all these ribs, we're going to use the nibbler on these two sides, and then we'll be good to use the shears to cut across the flats at the top and the bottom. So now I'm going to measure the distance in between these two verticals. That way we can cut out our bottom and our top support. Normally that would be called a header. However, this is not load bearing in any kind of way. This is just supporting the framing for the window itself. We're also going to cut some boards to box in this window. So the bottom and the top is going to be the width of the inside of the window without the brick molding that's on the outside. So the inside width of the window is 36 inches plus an inch and a half on each side to give us a total of 39 inches. And that accounts for the two by fours that are going to be sitting on it on each side of the window. So let's cut those out and also two sides at the same height as the window and we'll get this all assembled. So now we'll come 36 inches over. So that'll put us at 46 on this side. That's where our window will be. Now we need to mark an inch and a half on the outside of both of those measurements. So we got 47 and a half over here and eight and a half over here. So now I'm going to attach this bottom plate, which is going to act as the windowsill for now. Make sure it's nice and flush on the outside face. I like to pre-drill my holes before I put the screws in to give it less of a chance of splitting the wood. So this will be the window sill for now. We got our nice brace here and the bottom that's going underneath the window. Now we'll flip this over and we'll attach a couple of brackets. That way we can mount it to the verticals. So that completes our bottom brace. We'll go ahead and build out our top brace as well, and then we'll start installing them. All right, so now we're ready to install this support underneath this window. We want the finished surface of this wood to be a half inch above this cutout. So I marked both of these at 20 inches, which is one inch below the bottom of this case opening for the window. But the two by four on top will bring the top of the wood to 21 and a half inches, which gives me a half inch for the brick mold. Now let's make sure that our window sill is nice and level. Now that it's level, we can go ahead and put some screws into both of these angle brackets at the bottom. So now we're ready to trim out the window. We need to go ahead and measure and cut all of our trim. So we're going to start with a nice piece of J channel. You can see that it is in the shape of a J and that's why it's called J channel. You have this nice flat right here that will slide under the siding or if you don't have siding up, you can use this flat to just attach this J trim to the building. And then you have the bottom or the outside which is a one inch, and then you have the front, which is a one inch. This is a residential R panel J trim. They do make other dimensions if you have commercial or a different style panel. So I already have the measurements on my window. I have a three foot by six foot with the brick molding on the outside. It is 37 inches wide and 61 inches tall. I'm going to start by measuring and cutting the side trims. I like to use these factory edges that don't have tin snip marks on them. That way it's a nice clean finish. So my window is 61 inches tall, so I'll measure to 61 inches. So I'll add one and an eighth inches to that measurement. So I'm marking this piece at 62 and one eighth. And I'm going to mark this all the way around with my square. 
And now I'm going to cut off all the excess. So I'm going to be using some right-handed snips or some green snips to cut off this excess here. You always want the side of the snip that goes underneath to be facing the side where your cutoff piece is going to go. That way it doesn't mar up the surface. Once you have both sides cut, you can simply fold this over a couple of times and that metal will break in the middle. And now you have a nice clean cut off side over here and your factory finish side over here. The factory finish side is going to face up. We're not going to be doing anything else with that piece. Now the side that we just cut on, we are going to be doing something with that. Since we added one and an eighth inches here, we're going to pull that measurement back and we're going to mark one and an eighth inches back. At this point, you could also verify that it is the length of the window, which for us is 61 inches. So now we're going to make this mark across the bottom face of the trim. You don't need it on the front or the back. So on this side of the line, we have the height of our window. And on this side, we have one and eighth inches. So we'll go ahead and cut this tab. You'll notice I'm using green snips here and I'll be using red snips to cut this other side. You wanna come inside this corner and I actually like to go to the outside just a little bit. That way there's not a roll that's going to hang up on the trim that this is going into. So you just cut this back to the line and then we'll cut a little sliver out of this. Doesn't have to be much. That'll make this easier to bend down and also keep things from hanging up on it. Now I'm going to switch over to my left-handed snips so I can get inside this corner here. Once again, I'm gonna cut me a little sliver out of this. I'm going to fold this tab outwards. And this is going to hook into the bottom piece of trim. So now on this front face, I'm going to cut a 45 degree angle here. I'm going to come up about an eighth inch and leave this end boxed here. And we're going to be cutting that off later. Now you might see that this metal here is hemmed over on the inside of here. I'm going to take and open that up just a little bit. That way this can slide over the lip of that bottom piece of trim. And when I cut this off, it'll cinch it back together. At this point, you can go ahead and take off your plastic wrapping on here. Since my window is so tall and these sticks come in 10 foot lengths, I'm not able to cut both sides out of one trim piece. However, I can cut the bottom out of this cut off. That being said, I have me another stick right here and we need to go ahead and cut our other side trim piece. So we'll mark at the height of the window, which is 61 inches, and then we'll add one and one eighth inches, which will put us at 62 and an eighth inches. We'll make a mark there as well. The inside line, we only need to scribe across the bottom face of this trim. The outside line, we need to scribe all the way around. Once again, the bottom of the snips, I'll have facing away from the piece that we're using. So this will be the cutoff over here. Now we can fold this over a couple of times and break it off on that line. So I'm going to cut right here in this corner up to that line and maybe even a little to the outside. That way that curve doesn't face in and that'll prevent this from hanging up on the other trim that it's going into. I'll cut me out a little sliver here. Doesn't have to be very big. We'll do the same thing on this side. Now we'll fold this out at a 90 degree angle and we'll go ahead and make us a 45 degree miter cut from this corner here to about an eighth inch up from this corner here. If this hem closed on you, you want to open it up just a little bit with a flathead screwdriver. Now go ahead and remove the protective plastic film and we'll get busy making the bottom trim. So we're going to measure the length of the window. We're going to add two inches. Now we'll make a mark one inch in from each side of this piece. Now let's scribe across the top of this and we'll scribe across the top of this piece as well. And now this line out here, we're going to mark all the way around so that we can cut it off. Once again, I want the bottom of my snips to be on the cutoff piece. That way I don't gouge up the surface with the snips. Also, when you're cutting with snips, don't ever fully close your snips. You don't want the tips to touch because it'll make a little burr. Now we'll fold this and break this piece off. We'll use our snips to snip into this line at each corner 
and then we'll break this tab off. Now let's remove this protective film. Now on our top trim, we need to mark one inch back on each side. And then we'll cut our tabs. There we go. Now we are ready to install the trim. We'll go ahead and start by installing our bottom trim. Now, before we set this all the way in, I'll go ahead and grab one of the side trims. So this tab is going to go inside of this cutout right here. And also the backing plate on the side trim is going to go in front of the backing plate on the bottom trim. And the outside on this side trim is going to be all the way on the outside. Now we'll take the other side. We'll set the tab inside the bottom trim, the backing plate also inside the bottom trim. And then the front will come out. We'll make sure that this hem goes over the bottom trim. So we'll start by setting the top trim in on one side. Make sure that tab goes inside of the side trim. Now we'll pull the side trim out on the other side. Go ahead and get this top piece in. And we'll set it back in place. There we go. So I'm going to apply some silicone to the inside perimeter of this, about an eighth to a quarter inch away from the inside of the trim. This is going to allow the window nailing flange to be completely sealed to the trim. I'm going to add some extra silicone in the corners to make sure it's sealed up nice and tight, and also a bead across the bottom to keep water from rolling back into the window opening. I also went ahead and purchased foam closures that I'm going to be stuffing inside of here between the trim and the siding to help prevent water from penetrating to the inside of the building. Now let's install the window. Make sure you get it lined up really well. And then this bottom nail flange will slip in between this wood and the J trim. So if your side piece trim exceeds the bottom of your bottom trim, you can simply take your snips and cut off the excess. And there you have it. Now if it lines up pretty good like this one did, you can just leave it as is. Now we're going to install our header, which like I said, this is not a load bearing header. This is just our top framing support. Now that we have our top brace in, we can go ahead and put us a few screws on the top and the bottom. I'm going to put one directly over the corner of the trim on each side. One important thing to note is that if you do have vertical panels for your siding, you're going to want to make sure that the edge of your windows is in a flat section on both sides. That way, you can actually apply silicone before you put your trim on and then apply another bead of silicone inside of that trim and you'll be sealed up on both sides, which will make it much harder for the water to get inside of the building. However, I have horizontal panels and that's why I use the foam closures. I will be putting a bead of silicone on the inside of all this trim to help keep the water out. So now that we have the screws in the top and the bottom, we're going to go ahead and run screws up both sides to snug this siding panel to the wood framing and compress that foam closure strip to keep water from getting in behind here. I'm going to stick with the same pattern that they had on these other screws, so I'm just going to start right here. So that's how you install a window into a metal building. Hope you enjoyed this video. Give us a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel, and turn on your bell notifications for future videos.